Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. Violence continues to plague the Middle East as Palestinians act out their frustration uh, over Israeli behavior, and in particular, large increases in settlement expansion that threaten the hopes of a two-state solution. In a recent keynote speech at Brookings here in Washington, Secretary of State John Kerry gave stark warning to both Israelis and Palestinians about the risks of remaining on the current course. Joining me now is Laura Friedman. She's Director of Policy and Government Relations for Americans for Peace Now and a leading authority on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East on Israeli settlement policy and on Jerusalem. Thanks for joining us, Laura. Thanks for having me, Tim. Listen, uh, before we get into the issues in the region, I want to talk about Congress because okay. one of the things you do every week is monitor what Congress is doing. Um, I would say the meddlesome behavior of Congress in the process. Right. Um, one of the things you wrote about just this week was the effort to, through legislation, legitimize the settlements uh, and the invention of a term post-67 Israel. Right. Do you want to just describe, first of all, the meaning of the term and how it's being used in legislation to legitimate the activity? Sure. Well, just to clarify, and thank you for having me, um, I mean, the term post-67 Israel has only been used so far in one place, but it was in a notable place. It was used in a letter sent by two senior senators, Senators Cardin and Portman, who are the two senators who are sort of carrying the banner for this effort on settlements. Um, and they used it in a letter to the U.S. Trade Representative, essentially saying that we need to, to change our policy. And they're not saying anywhere we need to change our policy and support settlements. What they're saying is we need to push back on BDS against Israel. The boycott, Israel. divestment, sanctions. Exactly, yeah. which pretty much everybody in Washington, certainly in Congress, agrees on BDS against Israel, bad. But what they've done within that legislation is they've defined BDS against Israel to include activities targeting the settlements. They explicitly say, Israel, when we say BDS targeting Israel, we mean Israel, Israelis, and territories controlled by Israel. And which they the, then translate in the letter to post-67 Exactly. Okay. And I mean, it's, it's important to, to sort of draw this out because, you know, we can have a disagreement. I, I oppose BDS against Israel. There can be an honest disagreement about how you feel on BDS. What's problematic here is that this isn't an honest disagreement. This is what I call a stealth effort. Um, people are calling this a, an anti-BDS activity, pushing back against what Congress believes are European countries, European governments' policies of BDS. Well, there's not a single European nation that has undertaken any government policy that looks anything like BDS against Israel. What this really is, is about trying to prevent other countries from saying, that's Israel, these are settlements, and this applies for our trade policy. And this is unprecedented for Congress, and it's unprecedented. Um, this is being strongly backed by APAC unprecedented for APEC to come out in support of settlements. And they're doing it in this stealth manner, which means it's still getting very little attention. <laughs> the, the legislation passed? It's already, it passed over the summer um, in the first form, which was as part of what was called the TPA bill, which was the bill that gave fast track authority for the president to negotiate a trade agreement with Europe. Mm -hmm. And there it passed in a form which is you know, sort of, um, it, it's saying that this should be a goal. It doesn't, it's not binding and it's fast track, so it's not obligatory and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I think the White House decided that this was not, this did not rise to a level of changing U.S. policy and they issued a clarification saying we haven't changed U.S. policy. Um, it's now about to pass both the House and Senate in a much more binding form in another trade bill. It's called the Customs Bill, the Trade and Enforcement Act. Um, and that one's going to be much more problematic. And the question now is, are we going to see the Obama administration actually issue a signing statement? They're not going to veto it. No one expects that. But are they going to say, this is, this is crossing over into the executive authority? Not even just on settlements policy, but essentially this is Congress saying that we need to treat the West Bank as sovereign Israeli territory. Um, and that's not their right to do. Question. If the legislation passes even if the president issues the signing statement is it does it die when the president leaves office the no no um well first of all this effort isn't going to die period because i my expectations we're going to see this now over and over and over inserted into 
pretty much any piece of legislation where someone can find a hook to say we're protecting Israel against BDS, mm -hmm. and that includes settlements. Um, as far as a signing statement goes, if the president does issue a signing statement, I would remind people about the Jerusalem policy. You know, years back, long before Obama, Congress passed legislation compelling um, the executive to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and compelling the executive to put down Israel as the birthplace on the passports of people born in Jerusalem. A signing statement was issued at the time, and this was years ago. Subsequent presidents upheld that because this is about executive authority, and neither Republican nor Democratic presidents like to hand over executive authority. And that case was finally settled by the Supreme Court earlier this year when the Supreme Court ruled with more clarity than at any time in history that this is executive authority and Congress cannot compel the administration to recognize foreign sovereignty. So the Obama administration is in a very strong position to issue a signing statement. Would the next president, Republican or Democrat, in an effort to curry favor, change that policy? I mean, my instinct says probably not because this becomes the executive authority question. This isn't about Israel-Palestine at that point. Two, two issues, first of all, the U.S. has a policy on yes. labeling products from the West Bank. Yes. Um, Europe is uh, doing this at this point, and Congress is reacting to that. Right. First on the European side. Um, well, first let's start on the American okay. side. We do have this policy. We do. It's not identical to the European policy, and I think it, that's important for a couple of reasons. The U.S. policy, I'll, I'll be honest, I have not been able to track down what the U.S. policy was before 1995. That is one of my I can remember when I was doing Builders for Peace with Vice President Gore. Right. Um, the issue was uh, Palestinians having the right to export their own product. And right. No, too no, many I, of those products had a Made in Israel label. Right. Palestinians fought for and got the right to list them, and so the U.S. issued a policy statement right. on that. So the, I, so the 1995 policy statement was clearly in the context of a peace agreement and trying mm -hmm. to facilitate um, Palestinian exports and trying simultaneously to make sure Palestinians didn't feel like they were being told this is Israel and to not squeeze Israel with mm -hmm. the term Israeli occupied because that was also in the directive you weren't mm -hmm. supposed to say Israeli occupied. So it says West Bank and Gaza. In 97 that was updated to say you can say West Bank slash Gaza because under Oslo they're treated as a single territorial unit. All of this labeling was about the Palestinian exports, not because Congress didn't care about settlement exports. Let's remember, 1995, settlement exports, not really a big deal. Not a lot of settlement mm -hmm. exports to be talking about. Um, things have changed dramatically since then. So our policy doesn't distinguish within the West Bank between settlement exports and Palestinian exports. In theory, they should both be labeled West Bank or West Bank slash Gaza. The Europeans go a step further and distinguish, I think very logically, because they say people should know the point of origin when they buy things so they can make choices. So distinguishing between settlements and Palestinian goods within the West Bank. Um, so it's not an identical policy. What does this do to trade relations with Europe if the legislation passes and includes some kind of uh, negative uh, sanctions or some kind of negative uh, uh, reaction to European labeling right. requirements. Well, so it, it doesn't involve then sanctions there's something at this in, point. It, 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 there's not sanctions, but it, it discourages U.S. trade with companies or countries that do this. So, so basically it does two things right off the bat. One, it basically says that it has to be a priority in any U.S. trade negotiations. It's like this is a feature of our relations to try to discourage everyone from boycotting settlements or anything like that. Um, the other piece of it is the reporting requirement, and that's what people need to watch. Because essentially, it will create a blacklist of companies that boycott settlements, of companies that aren't doing business in settlements. And these, remember, are going to be European companies that potentially are doing it consistent with international law and European law. It doesn't prescribe sanctions as yet. I think any of us who've been down this road, people who remember the Helms-Burton experience, um, it's unlikely that Congress is legislating. The Helms Burton legislation applying to Iran and Cuba. And Cuba. Right. I mean, in general, my experience is that <clears throat> Congress does not ask a U.S. agency to compile, compile what is basically a blacklist of companies doing things we don't like, unless down the road there's going to be an effort to have some sort of sanction attached to that. Um, and I think it's not, um, a, it's not paranoid to, to look at that and say that this is intended 
to um, have a chilling effect on anyone considering black uh, uh, boycotting settlements, and down the road will open the door for potential sanctions, including extraterritorial sanctions. Pardon me for just getting a little colloquial here, but it's pretty damn crude, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, it doesn't make our standing in Europe look especially good when we basically are singling out Israel as a special consideration for future trade relations with our major European partners. Well, I mean, I don't have a problem with us singling out Israel. I mean, we've had, it's been longstanding U.S. policy to oppose, like, the Arab boycott of Israel. The problem here is that what this campaign is doing is it is using cover, the cover of we oppose boycotts of Israel and we oppose BDS to essentially corner people into supporting settlements. This is a shift in policy. The U.S. has never before, never has Congress before passed legislation supporting defending settlements. Never. This is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it's very sophisticated. This is very much what Netanyahu is doing when, you know, you, their best answer to labeling is to say this is anti-Israel and anti-Semitic. Well, it's not, it's not labeling. They keep, they keep talking about labeling Israeli goods. It's not labeling Israeli goods. It's labeling settlement goods. If you're going to say it's they're Israeli goods because they're made by Israelis, I'm sorry, if Israelis produce in China, are those Israeli goods? I mean, it becomes, it's a very odd framing, which I think the, the, what is sophisticated about it is that it, it works. I mean, mm -hmm. so far it's working. People, when, when I try to explain the nuances to people, it's, you know, people are getting snookered. Um, Let's, t let's talk about another issue in Congress, and that's the UNESCO fight. Sure. Uh, the U.S. was required by congressional law that any yeah. entity, an international entity that recognizes or includes the, yeah. the state of Palestine as a member or yep. an observer would be defunded. Yep. Um, and so UNESCO lost U.S. funding, um, and we're out of bind because with ISIS operating as it is and uh, Yep. Heritage sites uh, in several parts of the world are being threatened. U.S. wants to re-engage with UNESCO as the international agency that can protect the artifacts, uh, and yet they've got this law. Where does that stand right now in getting Congress to reverse itself on that issue? You know, I, I think that remains to be seen. I think the administration has um, sought to preempt um, opposition in Congress to restarting funding for UNESCO by by bringing on board the Israeli government, which has now, I think, taken the position that they don't oppose the U.S. restarting funding to UNESCO. Um, interestingly, I was just searching the congressional record for the past week, and I came upon a statement from Ileana ross um senior person on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, more or less saying, I don't care what Netanyahu says. I urge Congress to stick with this. This is terrible. Um, it, it's very much the cutting off our nose to spite our face. We're not hurting the Palestinians by not funding UNESCO. We're hurting ourselves. And it's, in, it's for the sake of a law that is antiquated, which dates back to the period in history when it was considered forbidden to suggest there would ever be a Palestinian state that was so far beyond the pale. We're, we're a decade past that, more than a decade. And yet, we're still clinging to this piece of legislation. One wonders if the people clinging to this legislation don't fundamentally still oppose there ever being a Palestinian mm -hmm. state um, under any circumstances. Now, I was gonna ask you a question about Sorry. what I thought is just a, um, a hilarious piece in, in your last week's uh, roundup of Congress, and that was the 23 bills on Syrian yeah. refugees. Yeah. I mean, it's almost as if these guys have too much time on their hands. You, uh, you know, I don't even really cover the Syrian refugee issue. I, I included those because when I was doing my research, it was just so astonishing to me how many there were, and I'd seen people writing about it, and I got the sense that people didn't understand quite how many there were. So I really just, I, I felt like I, as a public service, had to put it out there. And there's a whole, you know, there's more. There's been many more since then. I think there's sort of a truism here. You know, if we've always said no member of Congress ever lost political capital attacking the Palestinians. Um, I think here, no member of Congress sees it as anything but good for them to weigh in on the Syrian issue. Um, and, and in this, this is, case, banning the refugees from coming in or making or, or it more difficult. Or some version of that, certainly, or yeah, some version. And it, it's largely Republicans, but not entirely. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, you know, the, the visa waiver language, which just passed with strong Democratic support, I suspect a lot of Democrats didn't understand why it was problematic language. 
Um, Talk about that a little. What the, the problematic language in the visa waiver bill is? Um, again, this is not this is not my issue. Right. I mean, I follow I follow everything. Um, but this is not an APN issue. The visa waiver. The idea was, um, if we're so concerned about people coming in, and refugees aren't really the issue because refugees are the most vetted category of people coming in. A bigger concern really should be people coming in on foreign passports who don't need visas, which are all the Europeans and a few other places. And the concern that people who have those passports might be coming in to do ill. So you know, the idea was like, let's tighten that up. And so people started to look for ways to tighten it up. Do you tighten it up because somebody was born in a country of where there are problems right now? So Syrians who have a European passport don't qualify for the visa waiver. And, and the arguments can be made either way, but I mean, you can see some logic to trying to say, well, for now, this is problematic enough. The problem is, at, at the, sort of at the end of the process, language was added to that whole tightening up the visa waiver program to include um, any country, anybody who's from a country where, that, is let, that is a US um, FTO, a, fr a, a foreign terrorist organization, which basically means that um, anyone of Iranian origin is going to have a heck of a time traveling to the U.S., which um, I believe the Iranians and the Europeans believe is a violation of the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, because it will get in the way of trade relations. On top of that, because it's going to um, prevent travel for anyone who has traveled to Syria, Iran, Iraq, whatever, journalists, people traveling for humanitarian reasons, I mean, the whole range of people are basically going to have their travel um, if not curtailed, then made massively more difficult. Um, and I mean, every all the a whole range of civil liberties organizations, including ones that are not Arab American, have weighed in with concerns about this. Back to your home turf. Yes. The Haaretz conference. Uh, yes. It was fascinating. I thought it was a lot it was of a, fun. It was an all-star lineup. Yeah. Um, there was an article I saw that uh, Ron Campius mm -hmm. did, um, suggesting it was an antidote to APEC. That it was a sort of Challenging APAC on its on its American turf with right. alternate voices uh, speaking, it was huge. It was, I, I saw the folks who came and spoke. It was yeah. a very interesting uh, uh, lineup. The president uh, weighed in at the end with a, a video. Uh, Actually, Rob the Malley beginning, spoke. right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the end, toward the end, it was a surprise video. Yeah. With, oh, uh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nobody expected him to do it because he avoided the right. APAC one the last couple times, and so here here. It, Talk a little about the conference, what it means in terms of, of Haaretz doing it, number one. And number two, uh, what does it say about the internal debate in the American Jewish community? Um, okay, so a couple of things. I was there. Um, I was a participant. I was on, on a panel and did one of the short little TED-style talks. Um, it was a great event. I mean, just phenomenal, re remarkable panels, remarkable speakers, heavily substantive. Um, it, was, it, was really, it was really something. The idea that it is an antidote to APAC, I don't think makes any sense at all because it wasn't, I mean, it was basically the attendees were the professional level. I mean, this was one of those things where you or I are walking around in the halls and everywhere you turn, there's somebody you wanna to talk to who you know or who you have email contact with. It really wasn't a general public event. It was really for the folks doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, and then with videos and live streaming, which, I mean, gave a vision. I mean, the APAC Policy Conference, and, and Ron knows this, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what he was saying made it an antidote to it. The APAC Policy Conference has thousands and thousands of people from all over the country. It's really a rallying, building energy kind of thing. I think in some ways the panels are an afterthought. Um, to all of that, and I, I shouldn't, I, I'm not sure how APAC would characterize it, but I think the main event really is the bringing all those people together and creating this common sense of mission and vision and all that. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's what this was intended to be, and I don't think that's what this was. What it was, though, was a very serious event. The fact that Obama had the video address was highly significant. Samantha Power addressed the, the, the closing plenary. You had members of the Knesset. You had Saab Arakat. Um, I mean, it was it was highly substantive, very serious, and very um, challenging to the policies of the Netanyahu government. Challenging, very much so, very much so. Um, and it and, was the left, and in very and in, it was the left, but it was definitely. I mean, I was very clear. This it was it was largely the progressive Zionist left. Yeah. This was not the right. anti-Zionist left. I mean, there is another left. This was. I felt I came away feeling very energized, and seeing counterparts, Israelis and Palestinians, mainly Israelis, who are doing incredible work that I want to amplify. Um, it, it really was an extraordinary event, and I hope they do it again. Um, 
and I, I, I think I'm people Oda write about there. it more. Yes. Um, I, Iman came to visit me. Um, Iman Oda is the head of the Arab joint list of 13 yep. members of the Knesset. Um, a sort of a remarkable accomplishment in and of itself. Uh, they've maintained their unity despite the differences within uh, that coalition. Um, and um, uh, he made quite a splash here in the States. Uh, a yeah. little bit of controversy in one instance, but for the most part, um, he came away saying to me that he found American Jews um, much more progressive than Israeli Jews. Right. Um, and he himself felt energized by the visit. Talk about his appearance at the conference and what that was like. Look, I would encourage people to watch the video. I mean, he gave an extraordinary speech. I think most of the events that he did in this country, he did neither in, in Hebrew with a translator. Yeah. I, I, saw, I saw, heard him here in Washington, and he was very good. This was in English at Haaretz, and it was an extraordinary speech. He told me um, he was getting more comfortable with his English as he went on it, around it, the country. It came across. Yeah. It came across that he was more comfortable. It also came across that he was clear on what he wanted to say. Um, I think as he got more questions, I think he really did find... Um, the groove of what his message was. And it was an extremely powerful message, pro-democracy, we're going to either live together or this is, or Israel is not going to be a healthy place. It, it will only be healthy when it makes itself whole with its Arab citizens mm -hmm. and with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, he was just extraordinary. Um, I, I don't know quite else what to say. Now, uh, Rob Malley was there. Um, yes. Rob is somebody we've known for, for decades now. Yeah. and. He had an interesting comment uh, that I, I wanted to ask you about. Um, there are those who want to dismiss the importance of the Palestinian issue, and Rob said, you can't. Uh, it is a rallying cry for ISIS, and it makes our ability, America's ability, to coalesce mm -hmm. with Arabs uh, in this fight more difficult right. because they see us as, uh, as unbalanced in our policies. Right. Uh, how did that go over? Um, I mean, I, I'm going to be perfectly honest. It was such a packed day, and there were so mm -hmm. many things going on simultaneously. I'm really only yesterday and today reading what people were saying about it. It didn't. There wasn't a whole lot of chatter in the okay. hallways. Um, it's a very interesting comment, and I mean, Rob is a very serious, thoughtful guy. And he's now the czar, the anti-ISIS exactly. czar in the White House. And, and he wouldn't say this casually. I think, no. you know. I think a lot of folks, myself included, are are cautious about making this linkage. But the, the suggestion that it is harder for us to rally Arab, Arab parties to work with us when the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is blowing up, <laughs> um, it, it, to deny that is, is just, it's, it's to deny common sense. That isn't to suggest that you have to have, mm -hmm. you know, that this is, you know, everyone says, when you, when you suggest any linkage, the pushback is, well, you people think it's a silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve everything. But do you think it maybe would make it easier for everyone to work together, Saudi Arabia and company, quietly and publicly to fight ISIS? Of course. Um, as far as ISIS using it as a rallying cry, that's something he would know better. I'm not in any way an expert on ISIS. Uh, I want to, while well, I'm on this topic, before I get to Kerry, which I want to close up with, um, Netanyahu's been attempting to link ISIS with Palestine yep. his own way. Yep. saying that the, the kids who are doing what they're doing in Jerusalem and Hebron, uh, the, the main locations of the, of the violence, are uh, directed uh, by ISIS in the same way that Paris and San Bernardino were. Um, the Shin Bet even uh, repudiated that, saying yeah. that's, that's simply not the, not the case at all. Yeah. Um, part of me, almost like Joe Welsh to Senator McCarthy, would like to say, Mr. Netanyahu, have you no shame, no sense of decency? But, but uh, uh, t tell me a little about that. About that, that is that flying in Israel? I don't think it's fly not flying here or in Europe. I don't think. I mean, I haven't seen a, a tremendous amount of traction for the argument that Palestinians are doing what they're doing in support of ISIS. I do see still the insistence from everyone, except the security folks, who have a very different story. That. Everything that's happening is because of incitement, um, and you know it's part of. It, it's very. It's a very short distance from that to say this is all some flavor Islamic extremism and Islamic militants, which, you know, it's a very appealing narrative if you don't want to look at a more complicated issue. Um, I would suggest that, you know, if you're an Israeli politician, you are really casting about for any explanation because 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 16-year-olds going out. You know, girls attacking people with scissors, 
not acceptable. You cannot do that. That is a terrible thing. Do they deserve to essentially be executed as terrorists while they're standing there with scissors? And, and the policeman who, who shot the girl with the scissors is being investigated. But, you know, a 13-year-old with a ruler that's been carved into a knife. I mean, what motivates kids to essentially go out and, and commit these acts, which include essentially committing suicide by, by Israeli mm -hmm. police person in addition to trying to cause damage? And I mean, it's not, someone said to me, you know, what about you know, confidence building measures? That'll help. We can increase the movement in Area C. And I said, I, I don't think kids are going out committing suicide by policemen because they don't, there isn't enough sewage in East Jerusalem or there's not enough economic movement in Area C. I mean, that just doesn't, yeah. that doesn't yeah. scan. Um, there is a self-radicalization piece of this, which is very troubling because it goes so much deeper than incitement, any of the easy answers. There's a quote from Kerry that we're going to play um, from his speech at Brookings. Mm -hmm. uh, let's hear it and then I want to ask your, your comments on it. And the fact is that current trends including violence, settlement activity, demolitions, are imperiling the viability of a two-state solution. And that trend has to be reversed in order to prevent this untenable one-state reality from taking hold. Settlements are absolutely no excuse for violence. No, they're not. And we are clear about that. But the continued settlement growth raises honest questions about Israel's long-term intentions. He went on to say that he doesn't know where it's going and he doesn't know, think that Israel knows either. Um, some folks look at this as the administration washing its hands of, of the issue. I want to ask you a couple questions as we close. The one is, your assessment of those comments, one, two, is there something the administration still could do, something that they should do? Um, and if they don't, um, where are we heading, in your opinion? Okay, so very briefly, on those comments, which I, I'm very happy to hear. Um, and we have two minutes, what sorry. I, what I take away from those comments is, <laughs> Kerry and his team have been studying the materials. They are looking at the maps, they are looking at the numbers, and they are concluding what we have all known. Right now, the policies unchecked are leading to a one-state outcome. Whether that's the goal or not, that is where it is leading. Area C, all the home demolitions, settlement expansion, infrastructure growth, all of these things on the ground, on the map, you're building a one-state outcome. And a one-state outcome is antithetical to Israel being a Jewish and a democratic state. It is antithetical to having a two-state solution. So that's, that's where they are, and I'm happy that they're speaking truth there. In terms of what they can do, um, some people say, see this as washing their hands. I don't believe that they intend to wash their hands of this. I think that is a possibility. They, as, as I see it, they have three options right now. One, they can wash their hands of it, not even give out the pretense even of two states of, of trying to get a solution and just go through the motions of supporting Israel and finishing their term. The second option is some version of playing it safe, which is where you keep giving lip service to the two-state solution, but basically you only pursue policies that don't get you in trouble with the Israelis or APEC or domestic constituencies. Um, and if they go with either one of those options, we're pretty much saying the two-state solution is dead because these, these mechanisms are going on the ground and they're not going to stop. And the next president, even if they intend to do well, it's going to take them a while to get going. I mean, that's, that, President Obama will be the president on whose watch the two-state solution died. The option that they have is to find a different course. I call this a paradigm shift. Personally, I believe they need to go multilateral. That doesn't mean walk away and throw this in the lap of the international community. You have the Iran experience. We have an example of what multilateralism can do. We have Madrid, which was multilateral. We have Oslo, which was done without US leadership. We have Ronald Reagan, who before he left office, opened talks to the PLO. His legacy mm -hmm. was opening the door for the, for the, for the peace process and Clinton with the, the Clinton parameters. I mean, Obama can leave a different legacy that re-accredits the two-state solution and gives better options going forward. Thank you so much for joining us, Laura. Listen, you. if you don't get Laura's newsletter, you should get it now. Go on the APN Americans for Peace Now uh, website and you can subscribe. It's all the time we have for now. For more information, you can follow us on Twitter at AAIUSA, or you can check our website at AAI. USA.org. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week on Viewpoint.